Yeah, recording now. Okay. Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, which is coordinated by Octo and NatureServe. And I am uh, hosting this webinar uh, on behalf of Octo today. We're very happy to have you all here. Um, we're also very happy to have Re Rachel Lincoln Sarnoff here um, to talk about why polystyrene is the new microbead. Rachel Lincoln Sarnoff is the executive director of Five Gyres Institute, the ocean conservation nonprofit that first identified plastic microbeads in the United States and campaigned for a successful federal ban in 2015. A former journalist, Rachel was the executive director of Healthy Child, Healthy World, now part of the Environmental Working Group, and founder of EcoStiletto and MommyGreenest.com. She also has a TEDx talk, which I encourage you to, to uh, Google with her name and TEDx, uh, which talks about the big pitch, picture on plastic. So Rachel, welcome. We're so glad to have you here today. Oh, thank you. And before, <laughs> before you get started, I forgot. Um, we encourage you to ask questions. So Rachel's going to talk first, and then we're going to have plenty of time for question and answers. Um, you, can t you can send questions or comments in through the, the comment panel at any point, and you can also send them in through the Q&A section. The, what you send in the comment, um, depending on who you direct it to, could be public to everyone or just show up to the panelists. Or Q&As will just be private to um, the panelists. And we encourage you to send in your questions whenever you have them. You don't need to hold them to the end. Okay, sorry, back to you, Rachel. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. And I hope to get lots of questions so we can have a lot of conversation. Um, I'm going to just start by kind of giving an overview to the general problem um, of plastic and the ocean. And, and some of you may already know about this. So forgive me, but it'll just take a couple of slides and then we can get a little deeper. Um, so basically, we know that oceans provide 97% of our water supply, 50% of our auction, uh, sorry, oxygen. Um, they are clearly vital to our life on Earth, and right now they are 100% threatened by plastic. So a lot of people see this beach and they think that it is a, you know, a beach that's near where people live. And the fact is that actually this is an uninhabited island in the middle of the South Pacific. And you can see there, there's just a ton of plastic on this beach. So um, this brings me to this idea of islands in um, our oceans and specifically the idea of um, the islands of plastic in the oceans. Um, some people think of them as, I've actually had people even suggest to me that we could make them habitable <laughs> and build, you know, build structures on them for people who need housing. I mean, I think this is a, this is a concept that has really captured our imagination and um, for good reason, because when we think about plastic in the ocean in terms of an island, that's something that's a physical thing that's manageable. We feel that we can control it and, and perhaps eliminate it. Um, but despite the popular myth, um, microplastics in the ocean, they really aren't contained in an island, um, regardless of size, you know, some say Texas, some say France, it doesn't really matter. There are plastics that move in and out of the gyres. So you can see on the slide, those five gyres, North Pacific, South Pacific, et cetera, that's what five gyres was named for. These are the currents in the center of the oceans, but this is really not, those islands are really not the extent of the problem and we kind of need to look look beyond. Um, right now we are sending 8 million tons of plastic into the ocean each year. Uh, it's a huge number, but to put that in perspective, that's like dumping a garbage truck full every single minute. And that's why scientists now predict that by 2050 there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. So Five Gyres has been really studying this problem for a decade. This is our, our 10th anniversary year. And our plastics ban list, which is new, um, the 2.0 list, uh, which is national for the United States, is new as of this year. Um, and we are expanding the series um, internationally as well. Um, this list identifies the worst offenders, um, which are based on toxicity, recoverability, recyclability, and more. This is really the first time that anyone has taken all this data and kind of crunched it. Um, our 2014 global estimate, that was the first publication to assess the amount of plastic in the ocean. At that time, 5.25 trillion pieces. We'll be updating that later this year. And we've really seen firsthand that plastic in the ocean 
never biodegrades. It does break down though into smaller and smaller pieces. And these are microplastics. Um, but rather than thinking of them like an island, we need to start thinking about microplastics in the ocean just like we think about smog in the sea. So just like the particulate matter in smog, contaminants in microplastics are linked to human health problems. And that's where um, you know, I think we're starting to understand that this is a problem that we can't continue thinking about as contained as somehow manageable um, as an island. Um, plastic has this pretty unique ability to both absorb and leach toxic chemicals. Um, like endocrine disruptors, that's one class. Um, and studies have shown that in the ocean, one piece, tiny piece of microplastic that's less than five millimeters can be a million times more toxic than the water around it. So that's where you get to statistics like, um, and when I started with five gyres two years ago, 600 species that quickly was bumped up to 1200 species that are um, endangered or killed by plastic pollution. And those species really include us. So when small organisms and fish eat the microplastics and then they're eaten by larger fish, those contaminants can work their way up the food chain to the food that we eat. Um, researchers have found microplastics in 33% of shellfish, 70% of fish. We actually caught this fish. Um, you can see those 16 pieces of plastic that came out of it. We caught this fish in the middle of the North Pacific on one of our early expeditions. Um, recent studies showed that 83% of drinking water is um, contaminated by microplastics, 93% of bottled water. The best thing you can do is still filter your tap, which removes pollutants, can save you $600 a year or two. Um, so, you know, continue to, to filter tap. Um, and a lot of people will say, you know, these studies come out every few months, it seems like sometimes even weekly, there's a new study that's finding mac microplastics in, in um, you know, another part of our, of our world. And people tend to dismiss them by saying, you know, well, we don't eat the gut of a fish, right? And these studies are very, very low levels. The findings are low levels of microplastics. But we really have to remember plastics' unique ability to leach toxic chemicals like endocrine disruptors. Um, and these have been linked to obesity. They've been linked to infertility. They've even been linked for, to cancer. And today, 93% of Americans test positive for the endocrine disrupting chemicals that are found in plastic. So clearly it is affecting us. Um, you know, we don't know the extent of the effects on human health, but we do know that doctors are concerned. Um, so microplastic pollution is coming from many sources, um, some unexpected sources like our clothes. So a recent study a few years ago found that one synthetic fleece jacket can release as many as 250,000 microfibers in one machine washing. Um, and this is a challenge that uh, Five Dryers is planning to, to go deeper into in the coming years. But we've also found solutions, and that is where, you know, the story gets le less bleak. <laughs> um, in 2012, our team in the Great Lakes, working with um, uh, SUNY, Fredonia, State University, New York, Fredonia, um, discovered that plastic microbeads, which were then being put into scrubs and toothpaste and even cleaning products, um, were polluting the water table. You know, companies really didn't know that these products that they were making were going basically straight from your sink down um, escaping filtration and going into our, our water. Um, and once we went to companies like Procter & Gamble, like Johnson & Johnson, L'Oreal, they voluntarily began to phase them out. And that was really, um, you know, I think a really great, uh, story when it comes to looking at other types of plastics, especially polystyrene, which we will get to. Um, but once that started to shift and once we started to get local bands, we worked um, to, you know, collaborate this effort. It was a huge collaborative effort and eventually got a federal ban um, put into place by President Obama and that ban went into effect this year. So as of this year, 
We cannot manufacture with microbeads. We cannot import products with microbeads. And that really is a huge win. And that's really why I think now we want to draw the parallels to polystyrene because this is basically the next target on the list. So we're applying this game plan of, of kind of, you know, raising consumer awareness, working with corporations, and then also working legislatively to single use plastics specifically. So single use plastics mean things that we use once and then we throw into the trash or the recycling bin. And despite the fact that they're only used for sometimes just a minute, um, these plastics can last for hundreds of years. So the problem is that plastic doesn't biodegrade or decompose, as we talked about earlier, or as I talked about earlier, it does break down, but it's breaking down into smaller and smaller pieces that are still with us. In fact, most of the plastic that's been produced since it became popular in the 1950s is still on this earth in one form or another today. So for the past two years, we've been working really hard on polystyrene and what we're understanding is that many people don't even think that expanded polystyrene foam, which is you know often referred to as styrofoam, that's actually a, a brand name and technically not correct, but we still call it styrofoam. Um, most many people don't even think that that's plastic. It's you know it feels different than other plastics. It um, it acts differently. Um, that's part of the reason it's so. Um, problematic. The way that it acts, it breaks down so quickly, it crumbles so quickly. Um, many people don't think that's plastic, but it's actually a really, really difficult um, form of plastic to manage and one that we think should be banned, just like microbeads. Um, so like microbeads, polystyrene plastics, which are known by the number six, are environmental hazards. They're extremely toxic to make. They're difficult to recycle. Less than 2% of polystyrene was recycled in 2013. But polystyrene products are not just in that expanded polystyrene foam, you know, EPS foam, styrofoam form. They also are in a rigid form in many, many places that we don't even think about from straws to coffee cup lids to cutlery cups, even these red solo cups, which are so incredibly popular now, those are polystyrene. So what can we do? Um, and this is where that, that game plan that worked so well with microbeads, that, this is where that really comes into play. So um, it's advocating simultaneously on many levels. I think the first thing, we need to support better manufacturing. So this is a really interesting product. This is, a, this is actually an alternative styrofoam that's made from mycelium, which is basically mushrooms. Um, so working on kind of a supporting manufacturing that is pushing the envelope, that is, that is recognizing the problem and, and really trying to, um, to shift the way that we are creating and recovering products is, is key. The second piece is pushing for better legislation. So in 2017, Five Gyres helped drive the passage of California's 100th polystyrene ban in Culver City, and that's where we, our offices are, so it made a ton of sense for us to show up to council meetings. Um, but since then, 15 more bans have passed. Um, this is a map that you can see. We put this together for our Nix the Six campaign, which is how we're working on polystyrene. And so here is really, you know, this, this is interactive on our site. You can go to uh, fivedryers.org slash polystyrene and click on this map. And these are all interactive. So you can actually see these blue check marks um, represent where polystyrene bands have been introduced or passed. Um, and you can click on each one of those check marks and see the you know, history of that ban, when it was passed or when it was introduced, what the language is. Some of the bands are um, very comprehensive. Some include um, straw provisions. Some of them are, are fairly limited. So they do, you know, depend on the municipality. Um, but then on this map, you can also see kind of the counterattack. So these are represented by those X's, yellow, orange, and red, depending on where, whether they're introduced or passed. So these are showing where in the United States, this um, trend towards preemptive legislation, which is the ban on bans, um, which means where states are passing legislation that prohibits our right to regulate toxic plastics, generalized plastics in our communities. And that really is a reaction to not only 
the work we're doing on not we but we the community is doing on polystyrene um, also the work that's been done on bag bands um, this is kind of a direct direct reaction to that so you know take a look at that map we are also in the third piece which worked with microbeads and we're hoping is going to continue to work with with polystyrene is empowering individual activism so there is so much at stake here and um, this is really you know it's time that we all get involved so it's pretty easy to do this um, to go to fivegyres.org click that link add your name take the pledge basically that pledge is saying you will refuse single-use polystyrene that doesn't mean that you you know can't I mean there's so many challenges in terms of um, multi-use polystyrene and so we're not you know we're not asking you to say you're not ever gonna buy a new electronic if you know that it comes in polystyrene packaging there's it's difficult to get around some of these things luckily that type of polystyrene is much easier to recycle because it is um, pristine but what we're saying is you know if you know you're going to a to be somewhere where there's a you know polystyrene cup that a coffee will be offered to you just decline it you know bring your own cup bring your own cutlery bring your own straws make sure that you don't get into a situation where you have to take this single-use plastic and join this movement to um you know to get it banned um so we really are hoping that we can work together better legislation corporate ingenuity individual activism and really do um, what we did as a group collectively for microbeads um, for polystyrene plastic. So I'm gonna end the presentation piece here. You can see our kind of mantra, refuse, then think about reducing, reusing, and recycling, especially when it comes to polystyrene. You also can see my, um, the URL to Five Gyres where you can sign that pledge and then my email if you wanna um, communicate directly with me. I always welcome um, you know, connections to the community. And then I think we'll just open it up to questions. So I'm sure there are a lot and I'm looking forward to answering all of them. Okay, um, everyone, again, you can, you can send questions in through the chat or through the Q and A. Um, so Rachel, so there's been a, a you, you've shown the band so far, are there any others in the works right now that are, are being processed? I imagine there's, some yeah so um the map is really interesting we add to that map all the time and so you can see the you know the color coding shows you whether a ban is passed or introduced um and we also have information on that page that can um and this is the next the six page which is fivegyres.org slash polystyrene um there's also information there if you want to introduce a ban in your community, how to go about that. We have sample bans there. We have um, language on, you know, how to uh, speak at a council meeting. Um, we're actually introducing videos, hopefully later this, uh, this, this year that will help make that process a little less daunting for people because I think, you know, it's often challenging for people to get up and, and stand up and know what to say. But the truth is that type of local action is what is going to move this movement forward. Um, that's the thing that we need right now is for people to stand up in their communities and get those bands um, started and support them. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, we have several questions now. What are your thoughts on bioplastics slash biofoams, uh, both the production process and post-production use? So um, you can take a look at our ban list, um, our, and I referenced that earlier in the presentation. Um, there's a, a really interesting kind of case study on bioplastics um, and some analysis there. And that, again, is a national study. So that's, we're looking at national data from the United States. Um, you know, bioplastics, what, and, and there's no, this is the challenge, um, biodegradability, compostability, these things are not really regulated. So there's no, um, there are bodies that regulate, you know, and, and, and uh, will, um, I'm not sure of the right word. There are, there are bodies that are doing a, a, a good job of making sure that these, the standards are followed, but there's no mandate that companies putting the words biodegradable and compostable on their products have to follow those standards unless they're working with those organizations. That was a very 
convoluted way <laughs> of saying that sentence. But, um, you know, the challenge is that unless you have industrial composting, the plastics, uh, even though they are made from other alternative materials rather than fossil fuels, which is what traditionally plastics are made from, um, they're not going to break down any differently than regular plastic in a landfill, for example, or in the ocean. Um, and they're going to do the same damage to um, marine wildlife that um, plastic, petroleum-based plastic is doing in the ocean. So what we have to, um, I think, stop doing is depending on so-called good plastics, plant-based plastics, biodegradable plastics, as great as they may sound, there is no get out of jail free card for single use plastics. We have to um, stop our dependence on single use plastics and, and not try to just you know, shift gears to a different type that might be perceived of as better. If we are using combustible plastics, the only way to use those and really know that they are um, indeed being composted is if we know that the plastic from the facility where we're composting is getting picked up and, um, and processed through an industrial composting facility. And that is really, those are fairly rare. Um, so I think there's a lot more legwork that needs to be done before we can consider those, uh, any type of solution. Out of curiosity, what is different about an industrial composting facility? Very specific, um, very specific conditions of humidity and heat. So, you know, when you throw a compostable quote, I'm putting that in quotes, uh, plastic into your backyard composting, for example, it's not necessarily going to break down. Now, other compostable materials like, um, you know, paper-based materials, um, those, those do break down, wood breaks down, you know, those things do break down. But once you, once you um, turn something into plastic, it's not that easy to break it down into its components. Okay. All right. Thank you, Rachel. Okay. Lots of questions now. Um, thanks for your talk, Rachel. Could you tell us uh, which are the specific organic pollutants that can be commonly found sorbed to PS, so polystyrene? Yeah, there's actually a really interesting um, white paper that we have on our publications page that you guys can look at. Um, and that goes really deep into, into all of the studies and, and what they've found. We worked with um, the University of Toronto, Chelsea Rockman, earlier um, this year, and she did a really interesting study on toxicity and polystyrene. Um, what she found is that uh, an, an, un, an undetermined, and it will need more research, but an undetermined um, uh, uh, component of polystyrene does uh, is linked to reproductive toxicity and again this is a really you know very limited early study um, but we are seeing that 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 those uh, you know that there are that there is that that needs to be further explored I think the challenge is that many of the studies that we've seen in the past have looked at leaching of, um, of styrene for example but when you look at the conditions, um, they're not real life conditions. So what we really liked about Chelsea's study is that she was using real life conditions, um, you know, the same temperature that would that you would see if you were putting hot coffee in a, you know, in a, in a foam cup, for example, or if you were putting foam in a microwave, which no one should ever do, by the way. Um, and she was finding that leachate and the link to reproductive toxicity under those conditions. So I think that's something that warrants some more exploration, but definitely take a look at the, um, at the, at the paper that's on our publications page. Okay, thank you. Um, and then a question, what products do you recommend using to replace the use of polystyrene in your daily life? I think it's really, um, you know, it's just reusability. So um, I think that, that what we need to, to start looking at is how we, you know, go back to like how our grandparents or our parents drank coffee, for example, you know, like my, my father drank coffee from a, you know, a China mug that he balanced on the dashboard as he was driving to work, <laughs> you know, and, and there was not a, 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 a coffee, a plastic coffee lid on there to make sure that not a drop spilled. It was, you know, it was just, we, we thought about bringing things with us to, to fill up, right? So we didn't expect them to be delivered to us in a container that we could take with us. So I think it's just about reusability. Um, I have a great 
hot cold uh you know tumbler that i take with me i also just have like a plain stainless steel open cup that if you you know if i if i want to use it for water i can use it for water i can also use it for tea um so there's a lot of different different options out there but i think it's really less about the actual things to recommend and more about kind of recommending this general habit shift um when you know for example that you're um you know, there's food trucks all over LA. We all love our food trucks. When I know that I'm going to go to a food truck, I'll often bring a container with me because a lot of the food trucks are, are delivering food in styrofoam or, or other plastic containers. And I, you know, I just don't want to take my food in that. So I'll bring something with me. It's, it's a little bit of a shift. It's not that big deal once you start doing it though. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, I'm doing a river clean, cleaning expedition in the UK in May and June. Last year we did a similar trip and picked up a lot of polystyrene. I want to find a solution for that polystyrene this year. Are you aware of any way to reuse re or recycle it? Yeah, the, the problem with polystyrene is it, it really, um, it's just, it's not a good material for recycling. Um, it, unless it's pristine it's not going to be recycled so unfortunately you have to landfill it um if you're finding it and that is just the hard truth okay that's not great to hear all right no. <laughs> um another question can you give us some more information on the mushroom substitute for polystyrene yeah yeah oh, well i'll finish the question and then oh sorry <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> I know, I know. It's great. At what stage of development and introduction is it at? Are what are the plans to mass produce, or is that not feasible? Yeah. So it's actually a company that is um, is doing really well. They're called Ecovative. E C O V A T I V E. I'm not sure what the URL is, but um, I think it's pretty easy to search. Um, and yeah, they're amazing. So definitely check them out. They're the only one that I know of that is that is um, doing this now. Um, but, you know, I, I think there's, there's a lot of really fascinating innovation in this space um, that is really exciting. Okay, great. Um, let's see, is there a database of wildlife entanglements or mortality due to plastic? I don't know of a database. Um, I could see if I can find one. So the information, uh, on that is on our website. So there's a, a page. Um, there's a, if you go to the website, you'll see a drop down on the left. That's a take, that's our take, take action um, section. And there's a plastic and animals um, tab there that you can click on. Um, I don't know of a database, but if you email me, I can see if I can find one. And meanwhile, there's more information there. Okay. Thank you. Okay, this one. Hi, Rachel. I'm from Suriname. I would like to develop a strategic plan towards a polystyrene-free environment. Um, do you have any advice where to start or what to take into consideration? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of resources on um, the fivejars.org slash polystyrene page, which is our Nexus 6 page, um, in terms of uh, sample bands. I mean, if you're creating a poly, I'm not sure really what you mean by polystyrene free environment. I think if you're, if you are trying to ban polystyrene, which is really the only way you're going to be free of it, I think, um, there are a lot of resources there that you can, that you can take a look at. Um, and then you can also email me if you, if you need more information. Okay, great. Thank you, Rachel. Um, another question. It looks like Five Gyres does educational outreach, which is great, but we know that education only goes so far. To actually bring out transformative change in spaces like this, you need to change behaviors. Does Five Gyres have any strategies or programs to engage the public through social marketing, or are others doing this? Social marketing. So, um, do you mean social media? I'm not sure. Uh, no, just... Um, things to bring out behavioral change. So mm -hmm. messages that will actually change behavior. So in yeah. Terms, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's our whole, that's everything. We, <laughs> everything we do has an element of, of, um, you know, encouraging behavioral change. Um, I think, you know, the first step for polystyrene with us is, is asking people to sign that pledge to refuse single use polystyrene. So, um, you know, making sure that they are making that commitment to stop using this, um, this 
plastic product. We're um, echoing those um, that information. So that's our current action campaign, and and that again has a legacy with with microbeads. When we did the microbeads campaign, we had a bead free um, a bead free pledge, and we now have a general plastic free pledge, which is really um, and you can you can choose both, um, which is choosing to pledge to refuse single use plastic products in general. Um, and those are echoed on our social media um, platforms. We're reaching about a million people every month there. So really trying to encourage um, encourage people to make those pledges, make those shifts, um, and then get you know deeper engaged in a deeper and more meaningful way. I think that's where you know that legislative and corporate piece come in. Uh, we had a really interesting um, group effort with the Break Free from Plastic movement, which we're a part of last month, where we um, we joined together to petition Starbucks uh, to inc you know to, to to live up to their goals of reusability and recyclability. Um, our focus at Five Jars, of course, was more on the reusability side, um, and a um, million people signed that petition and that was delivered to shareholders um, at Starbucks uh, meeting last month in Seattle. So, you know, those types of deeper actions, I think once you start taking these steps, you, you know, you, those personal steps really lead to, to, to bigger commitments. And I think that's, that's really the exciting part of being part of this movement. Okay. Thank you. Um, it says, hi, in France, we do not use styrofoam cups for coffee, so it's not a major problem. However, styrofoam is used extensively in supermarkets for packaging meat, poultry, seafood, so with direct contact to food. Is there any alternative to date that could replace this usage that's viable economically? Yes. Um, I have to find the name of the company, but there, there are companies innovating in this space, creating trays so what you're talking about is the tray that that um that the the, the product goes on to be sold in a supermarket they're um, they have a yeah, specific totally. name but i can't remember what they're called but anyway they're trays um they are innovating um with a, a truly biodegradable alternative to that um world centric they're called world centric <laughs> um and uh if you can't find them email me and i'll try to connect you but yeah i think that that you know, those are the places, again, where we have to, you know, we, we choose to make the pledge to refuse. Um, and then taking it to the next step is, is, you know, finding alternatives, contacting um, uh, companies. So in this case, it would be the grocery manufacturer. If you find an alternative and you can go to, um, you know, begin that process of conversation, um, you know, that's, that's where that big change begins to happen. Okay. And I don't know if you have more to add from things you've, you've already addressed, but there was a question that came in. What have you used to replace polystyrene in municipalities? Um, yeah, so that is kind of a different question. So we're working on a price breakdown of, um, of alternatives because so in places like Culver City, for example, which is where we're based in California, uh, we no longer, uh, you know, the polystyrene is now banned. So you're seeing um, these alternatives out there. And, um, and, you know, often, especially for smaller, um, you know, smaller restaurants or, or coffee shops, they feel they're concerned. And a lot of this has to do with the marketing around um, polystyrene by the polystyrene manufacturers. They feel that they have no other choice. But there are a lot of choices out there that are much, much safer um, much better for the environment. And we have some breakdowns on the Nix the Six page, so you can go there to look, but we're looking into a, a deeper analysis of that as well. Okay, thank you. Um, and then there was a comment that was made uh, in response to the previous question about um, social marketing, and it was Sea Grant and the NOAA Marine Debris Program uh, are doing a lot of work on social marketing to spur behavior change. We are conducting research um, and looking at the effectiveness of education to spur behavior change in regards to single-use plastic consumption with the goal of reducing plastic use. So Great. that's one. Yeah, question. there's a lot of organizations working on this. I mean, it's you know, if you go to the Break Free from Plastic um, uh, page, which is breakfreefromplastic.org, I think there's, I think there's more than a thousand um, 
NGOs involved in that movement now. And we're all really working towards the same goal, um, which is shifting the way that we are um, viewing single use plastic as something that is in plastic in general. You know, we, we want to make sure that people understand this is not a benign substance. This is not something that we can throw away. It doesn't go away. Um, and really starting to value it more, you know, starting to, to, to think about it in the way that we think about glass or, or metal. Um, that these are, you know, you'd never throw a glass glass into the trash, but many people would throw a plastic glass into the trash. And right now, you know, the cost of glass and the cost of plastic, sometimes those can be fairly negligible. So there's, there, we need to start thinking of, about plastic, um, you know, in a, in a different way. And, and the Break Free From Plastic uh, movement is really uh, an interesting, you can, you can see a lot of different uh, international global collective action on this front. Okay, thank you. Um, somebody asked whether your slides would be available. I will let them know that we will be posting a recording of this webinar on the openchannels.org website um, in the next couple of days. So that recording will be available. Um, and uh, you, if you could contact um, me independently, then I'll, I'll be in touch with Rachel as to whether the actual slides are available. Uh, let's see. Um, there's a question, what, what's the best substitute for big garbage bags? Yeah, garbage is interesting, but can we just go quickly back to the slides, just because I just wanted to share with you guys also that um, if you are interested in getting involved deeper in this movement and working with Five Gyres, we have more than 500 ambassadors, global ambassadors all around the world, and they all have access to our um, speaking PowerPoints. So, you know, their their commitment to us is really to um, to kind of embody the plastic-free lifestyle. So refusing single-use plastics and trying to share that with their communities. Um, and then they also have a commitment to, um, to kind of promote this, this you know, messaging in, in whatever way makes sense to them. If they are people who are you know, you know, crazy on social media, then do it through social media. If they are educators, then a lot of them are speaking to classes. We have one, uh, she was then 14-year-old ambassador here in the United States who in her state of Georgia got um, something called Plastic Pollution Awareness Day passed. So it was a commemorative day that the entire state of Georgia um, acknowledged uh, for the past two years. And this is the action of, of one of our ambassadors, Hannah Testa. So this ambassador program is phenomenal. It's really awesome. And it also allows you to connect directly with all of these other ambassadors on this private, um, in this private group. So if you have projects that are related to this mission, um, then you can not only share them and amplify them through the Five Gyres community, which again reaches about a million every month on social, but you can also connect with all the other amazing ambassadors um, to, uh, you know, to support their projects and potentially have them support yours. So that's how you would, if you were interested in, in you know, in getting this actual presentation and being able to share it, um, that that program would be a great one for you for you to look at. Um, and then, okay, trash bags. So this is a question. Well, let, me, let me go back. Is the information <laughs> for becoming an ambassador on the website? Yes. So fivegyres.org slash, it's under programs. So fivegyres.org slash ambassadors. Okay. Thank you. I'm glad you went back to that. Okay. Now <laughs> to, to, to the Yeah, garbage. trash bags. So we get this question all the time. It doesn't specifically relate to polystyrene because, you know, trash bags are not made from polystyrene, but plastic in general, um, you know, there are... Um, plant-based trash bags again you know you're you're looking at challenges because those are not the, you know your trash bags are not taking to the compost while you the interior of the bag is taking to landfill um we encourage people to uh to really separate their trash so really try to compost as much as you can try to recycle as much as you can and then some are even using trash bins without bags so if you are composting a lot of your wet trash um, and you're recycling a lot of your a lot of your um, you know plastics and bottles, then you end up with very little um, trash that you can then just dump directly into the bin. So there, you can circumvent the need for trash bags altogether. Um, you know, it just takes a little a little different uh, effort. Okay, thank you. Um, and let's see. That may be all the questions we have. So 
right now. So if anybody has any more, if you just send them in really quickly. Um, and you can I also can... email me directly if you guys have any questions and, um, you know, that these questions were really great. <laughs> so I'm, I was, I'm thrilled to have this conversation with you guys. Okay. Well, great. Rachel, thank you. This was fantastic. Um, I, I, it, was, it was great to learn about what you're doing. And um, I, I hope we can, uh, many of us can go research the ambassadors program and become ambassadors. Yeah, that would be great. And sign the pledge. I mean, you know, I think we're at 5,000 now. We're definitely trying to, you know, to get, to get that pledge going. And that is also a group that um, we communicate with directly. So on legislative action, there's a lot of movement to ban um, polystyrene in a bigger way in California, which if you're outside of California, it kind of, you know, makes you scratch your head, like, why should I care about that? But actually, the truth is that because California is so big and um, has such economic power, banning a plastic in California can lead to um, bigger action. So we are really excited about that prospect. And that's really what we're kind of empowering the Nix the Six group to get involved with. Um, there was a, a ban, a, a bad bill that was up for um, in the California legislature, which was a bill promoted by the polystyrene manufacturing industry, written by the industry. And we motivated our communities, all of the you know, people involved in this fight, including our Nix the Six community, people got on the phone, they started calling, they started tweeting. And what do you know, that bill was killed last week. So the bill is off the table. And that is a great, great success. So um, I would love it if you, you know, if you guys, even if you're outside of California would consider getting involved in this fight, it is a global fight. Um, and it, it, you know, it, it can, we can do for polystyrene what we did for microbeads. I know we can, we just have to um, get involved. Okay. Well, congratulations on that, Rachel. Thank you. Um, there was one, an, addi an additional question that came in, and that's what about styrofoam packaging? Are you also working on that? Yeah. So again, styrofoam packaging, um, you know, that is uh, a bit of a bigger challenge because we as consumers don't have much control over that. Um, often when you buy something, you don't know what it's coming in. But what you can do is when you do receive it, you can let that manufacturer know or that shipper know that, um, you know, for example, Amazon, there's a big push to, to make Amazon more responsible for um, what it's shipping products in. Um, you know, let them know that, that you do not that polystyrene is not something that you accept and that you, you know, would there, there are alternatives that need to be, you know, there's so many companies now are, that are doing something, you know, things as simple as building shipping, um, you know, recycled cardboard shipping packaging that is, pa that is fit, that fits the product. So they don't have to fill it with, you know, some sort of foam, but there's also like alternatives to, to foam peanuts out there that are actual biodegradable, um, you know, made from starch. There's like so many different alternatives. So if that happens, so you say you get a TV and you get that box and it's, you know, the TV's packed and expanded polystyrene foam, you can in some places recycle that polystyrene foam. So you have to look, look up your zip code and, and find out if it's recyclable in your zip code, because it really does shift from zip code to zip code. Um, and, then contact that manufacturer and let them know that that's you know not something that you want to support. So at that point, that's we're limited there, but um, hopefully we'll continue to evolve this campaign and and get on that too. Okay, and uh, another question came in. Uh, said, "Great work! I was at the sixth uh, International Marine Debris Conference, and five gyres contributed a lot. How can you tell if compost bags are compostable at home uh, versus industrial compost?" How can you tell if compost bags are, um, so the, so I don't know of any compost bags that can be home composted. I don't, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question because I don't think that product exists, but I could be wrong. Um, so maybe email me and, and we'll try to get to the bottom of that. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I believe that the answer is that none are going to say that they're going to be safe for home composting because the conditions are so variable. Like industrial compact, uh, composting, you know, is like a very set uh, conditions that have to be laid out in industrial complex or composting. But, you know, at home composting, you know, you don't like have to have a certain temperature or oxygen or anything like that. Yeah. So, I mean, if you have like a really good composting setup, you know, like kind of one of those 
tumbler things, you know, that like regularly aerates the compost and stuff like that. Uh, I mean, it's possible that you could get some of those things to compost at home, but I think overall you're not going to find any that say that they can. Yeah. I don't, that's what I'm saying. I don't think I've, I don't think I've seen that marketed. Yeah. I love that we just got the voice of God. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry. I just unmuted myself. Well, oh, actually, jump in, jump in. <laughs> that was hilarious. <laughs> and and Nick Wainer, who is, uh, is, uh, works for, at Octo. Yes. Sorry. Um, and I've, I've been looking at this actually for our own composting needs and yeah, no, it turns out there's like nothing at all for home mm-hmm. composting. Mm-hmm. Okay. And well, and there was sort of a more specific question along those lines. Kate Holmes was looking up uh, compostable bags at World Centric. And there, are, I'm guessing their website says, World Centric is happy to offer our own line of compostable bags made from a mixture of synthetic and starch based plastics. And she said, I'm not sure what this means. Can you maybe explain uh, that is what is a starch is a starch based plastic? Is that really a plastic? Yeah. So, um, so all so most of the what is being marketed as compostable biodegradable plant-based plastic those are all um you know they're they're like corn or soy um they are vegetable you know based plastic so that's really what we were talking about with the bandless study you can take a look at that biodegradable you know biodegradability piece of that study um but world centric, um, what I'm really interested in are the trays. So because those are providing specifically um, an alternative to the polystyrene, expanded polystyrene foam trays that we see meat and, and cheese and things packaged and sold on. So um, that's where I think, you know, a lot of companies that are making um, different products are using different types of alternative plastics. Um, and some of them, you know, we would argue are, are, better as alternatives than others. Um, but, but yeah, in general, I think the, the interesting thing for me with world centric was specifically those, uh, those trays. Okay, great. Thank you. And that's the last question we have. Thank right you guys. Now. Thank you so right. much. Yes. Rachel, thank you so much. This was wonderful. And we hope to have you back on yeah, um, relatively that. soon to answer all of our recycling and composting yeah, questions. That's good. <laughs> thank, thank you. Nick, <laughs> as well as Nick. Yeah. With the voice of God. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. And have All a great right. rest of your day. Bye. You too.